To be unique, you must create mystique. Hello, my friend, and welcome to the Sales Podcast. This is Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer, your host. Today, we have Mr. Matt Suggs on. Matt uh, has another unique background, kind of like Jason. Uh, he came from a big company. He was actually employee number 393 at Ariba before they were acquired by SAP, but he wanted to get back to the small side of things. Uh, he was employee number 10 at Mediafly. Now they've grown up to 75 employees. So still on the small side, but doing big things. And uh, you will like his advice on connecting with B2B salespeople uh, and how their own product as well. I may have to have them on the CRM Sushi podcast to demo uh, because they are an alternative to PowerPoint. Praise the Lord. Oh, my goodness. But I digress. You know, it's been tough getting this going here. I got the trash guy here and their beeping going on, the dogs. Monday, the cleaning lady comes. We're going to have to move that. I do all my recordings on Mondays, and that's when my wife has the cleaning lady come. She wants to vacuum. Amen to vacuuming, but it does impact with recording. And then my 20-year-old son just came home. He's had long hair since I don't even know when. I think all through high school, I'd have to go back and look at pictures. So easily four years, maybe six years. I don't know. I don't know. And he came home just now with a buzz cut. Oh, but still my beating heart. He looks so good. So I had to delay that for about five minutes to go see my boy. So it's crazy times here in the summer at the sales whisperer Casa. But you didn't tune in for that. No, you didn't. So we're going to bring Matt on. But if you're listening to this before July 5th or even after July 5th, you know, I'm starting another live uh, portion of the Make Every Sale community. Uh, But actually, after talking with Tom Poland, so Tom, he's going to be published here in about a month. Uh, Actually, maybe just a a few weeks. Uh, But Tom has given me some really good insight on how to structure my group training. And that's the benefit of doing this podcast. I get great advice from great people and I apply it. You know, I am, I'm not a know-it-all. I think if you've listened to this more than a few times, you know, I might know one or two things about one or two things, but I don't know everything about everything. And, um, so I'm looking at a couple of ways to run the make every sale course and to keep it fresh, to keep it going. Cause I like doing the live training. Um, everybody says, Oh, record all this stuff on demand. And you know, you don't have to be there. And and it's like, there's this big race to just sit on your butt. And I mean, I kind of get it, but I kind of don't, I don't think we were put on this earth to coast. Uh, I don't think we were put on this earth to work our fingers to the bone and, and die at the desk either. Um, I think we're supposed to work. We're supposed to produce. And I know that my life changed in 2006 when I took the live 12-week teleclass from Steve Clark. Uh, I've had him on the podcast. I was able to meet him in person back in January. Um, the first time in a while I'd seen him, and I spoke to this mastermind group for a couple of hours. But, but that 12-week course, and it was just a teleclass, no Facebook groups, no video, no archives, uh, no physical products. You know, it was a PDF, but that live call gave me hope. I had something to look forward to every week. And because I was passionate, Steve, he would answer my questions offline. And I remember one time he even took a phone call from me when I was preparing for a big meeting. And again, that was above and beyond. And I don't know, that just stuck with me. I feel like having some type of live interaction, regular interaction, not this once a month stuff, you know, not this, oh, be like Bigfoot and you're lucky to ever see me. I I just, I don't think that's the way to do it. I have on demand content. Uh, there's 41 videos in the make every sale course. Uh, there is a workbook. There's, there's PDFs, there's spreadsheets. There's all type of good stuff. But I think that weekly call is important. Uh, And I've been doing it nonstop for a couple of years, several years. And I've done a, you know, a live like seven call, uh, push a few times. I'm just not big onto launches and whatnot. So Long answer to telling you, stay tuned for more access uh, through a couple of programs, uh, group programs. So they're going to be affordable um, and you'll you get access to me. So stay tuned. But if you would like to enroll now in the Make Every Sale course, please do. MakeEverySale.com. Um, and like I said, we're going to be doing some live uh, seven-part series starting July 5th, 2018 and beyond. 
But now let's bring on our guest. Matt Suggs, Executive Vice President, Media Fly, all the way from Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. Welcome to the Sales Podcast. How the heck are you? I'm doing great today. How are you doing? I'm good. All right, man. Important question right off the bat. I have two important questions. Was USF as good at football when you were there, or did they get better once you left? Well, they got dramatically better once I left because uh, they didn't have a football team until 1997, I think. So well, I, I, I left. <laughs> so they, they I guess no they did football. get better. <laughs> yeah, they did get better because they had nothing. Um, they had nothing when I was there. And I see you were in the Army, which is almost as good as the Air Force. So, you know, welcome to a fellow veteran. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate <laughs> it. So, man, Media Fight, you've got a – you're a little different for someone uh, on the show. You've got a lot of big company experience. Uh, looking back at GE, um, SAP – well, was it SAP, which is uh, Ariba? Yeah, so it was – so I was at Ariba before they got acquired. Okay. And – um uh, so, you know, the way I look at my background is certainly the Army and General Electric and Oracle are all really large organizations. Um, Ariba, when I joined, I was employee number 393 and oh, wow. um, watched it go to about 2,000 employees and then kind of back down to, you know, around 1,000. And, um, uh, and then, I, then I, you know, uh, moved over to Oracle which had at the time they had about 115,000. Um, I was there wow. when they made the acquisition of uh, Sun Microsystems. Mm-hmm. They had done like 50 acquisitions in the, in the four years uh, prior to me joining the company. Right. Um, and then I went to become employee number 10 at Mediafly. So I've worked at a, a variety of different size organizations. Right. Uh, and how big is Mediafly now? We've got about 75 employees. Um, Most of them are located in Chicago. So our development organization, operations, headquarters, all located at um, Michigan Avenue in um, one of the more well-known buildings in town. The the Crane Communications Building is is always highlighted in the uh, skyline when they show football games at, you know, at Soldier Field. And uh, it's a really great space. And um, we've been there for um, two or three years now. So are you managing and leading remotely then? Yeah. I, like I tell most people, I, I spend most of my time on the airplane. And um, actually later today, I'll be flying down to, to uh, Sapphire Conference, SAP's big user group conference in Florida. But I, I uh, find that commuting out of Raleigh is, is a lot more convenient than commuting out of Chicago. Right. So, um, yeah. As long as there's not hurricanes, right? True. Yeah. <laughs> so your salespeople, do they uh, live in the, their own territories? They, they do for the most part. We do have a concentration because we're a startup. Uh, we do have a concentration of people in Chicago, but I've got folks on the West Coast as well. Um, we've had employees on the West Coast for several years because we have a, a few of the large uh, studios are customers of ours as well, like um, the Walt Disney Company and NBC Universal and Sony Pictures Entertainment. So um, we've had a we've had a California presence for a while, and we have employees. Um, I also manage the customer success team, and um, so the, so really everybody that touches the customer ultimately reports to me. And I've got employees in in the Pacific Northwest and um, Florida as well. Right. Yeah. Can Can y'all talk to Disney about Star Wars? I mean, this whole Han Solo thing they they should have done better, man. Can you Can you Whip them into shape. <laughs> well, I think I, I'm not. Sure, I haven't seen the movie yet, <laughs> so <laughs> I think that you know the issue was the production. You know, you you heard a lot of rumors about the production. I think that's that's hurting you know the box office a little bit because they had to change the they changed out the director I think and a few other things. But you know, you look at you look at everything else they're doing. Um, you know, they with all the Marvel products and the Star Wars um, franchise, they've been they've been doing pretty well the last few years. They've made a, a, a billion or two here or there, you know, pretty yeah. soon we're talking real money. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so what are some of the challenges you face with having a remote sales team? Um, I know uh, historically, I mean, that's been my background. I mean, 22 years in sales, I've always lived in the field, uh, yeah. in my territory uh, sometimes not seeing my boss for, for weeks, you know, months on end, sometimes when I was with a really small startup. Yeah. Um, 
you know, for our listeners that may be in that startup mode, maybe in uh, trying to grow a smaller company uh, with a remote team, um, what have you found to be, you know, some good ways to, to manage that team and continue that up and to the right? Well, I think that the biggest challenge uh, for, especially for a sales leader being remote is, is actually the connection to the rest of the staff. It's not really the connection to the salespeople. Um, I, I find that our normal pipeline activities and managing deals and, and going out and meeting with customers keeps me in really close touch with my salespeople. Um, you know, I even assist with uh, one, of our, one of our folks in Munich um, I, I talk to him on a regular basis and, uh, he doesn't actually report to me, he reports to somebody else, but, um, I find that staying connected with the salespeople is relatively easy, but I have to put in a little extra effort to stay connected with, you know, our product and engineering team and the other operational parts of our business. So, um, that's probably the bigger challenge. I think today with, with all the changes in, in, um, you know, remote conferencing and web, web-based conferencing, it's pretty easy to jump into a virtual conference room with uh, a group of people and, and stay connected with them. Yeah, I remember one of my first sales jobs selling mobile homes in Mobile, Alabama. Uh, our manager paid for us to go to the factory. Um, and I don't even remember where it was. I want to say it was in Georgia. Uh, so it wasn't just, you know, a day trip. Uh, cause he wanted us to get to know them. And then I was working with a, with kind of a startup. They were, they'd been around for a long time, but got acquired by a bigger company. So it kind of had that feel and they were up in Utica, New York. So I'd, I'd fly from Austin to Utica and that is not an easy trip, but my no. boss knew like he wanted us to know the people there, the people making the product, the people shipping the product, the people helping with the RFIs, RFPs, RFQs. Uh, and it did, it, it made a difference. Um, oh, it, abs- it absolutely makes them. a difference um, to know the folks that are producing the product. And when I was at Ariba, uh, we would make regular trips out to um, California where the primary engineering group was at the time. And um, that's how you built relationships with them. It was a lot more challenging uh, when I went to work at Oracle because we had product teams that were geographically distributed as well. So, um, yeah, I think I think the key is – in, in today's world with all the um, web conferencing capabilities, um, that's how we stay in touch with folks. Even our engineering team, we've got remote remote uh, workers today. So um, the world's becoming more virtual and, and the tools have kind of kept, uh, or I would say they've, they've permitted that. So, right. So would you say, is that what you're doing with MediaFly? I mean, you've been there over eight years. Yeah. Um, and it's saying, so it's, it's aimed at the, the large enterprise, right? But you're saying from just from LinkedIn, I'm reading, right? Enables your salespeople to deliver real time, relevant and personalized insights when meetings with their customer, uh, with, with their customers, I'm sorry, when meeting with their customers and prospects. So is it some kind of dashboard? Is it like a right hand column sort of thing in outlook and Gmail that, that, that pulls in information? So well, it's, my so we, yeah, so we have, while we have some of those capabilities, like the integration to Outlook, um, integration to things like Salesforce, where I can access all my sales and marketing collateral from inside of Salesforce.com. Um, the primary objective of MediaFly is it's an application that you, uh, unlike those other solutions, it's an application that you use in front of your customer. So oh. you, organize, you organize your presentation materials, and it can be a wide variety of things from uh, video, PowerPoints, uh, PDFs, uh, all kinds of different um, marketing pieces that you might have. You can assemble those into a, into a, you know, a contiguous presentation uh, that feels seamless to the customer. So the idea is that um, we make it much easier for your typical salesperson to assemble content that they want to go out and, and use in front of a client. And then while they're presenting to the client, we're able to track those experiences um, and, you know, do some things like automatic call reporting. We're able to use machine learning to analyze what content works most effectively with, uh, with um, clients. Um, we're able to provide the salesperson with tracking when they, share content with the customer to see if they actually opened it. So those types of things, it's really designed to be 
um, the frontline selling tool uh, for both the large enterprise and small and medium business customers alike. So, you know, we do have a lot of, you know, great uh, logos like Goldman Sachs and PepsiCo and Miller Coors, uh, the Walt Disney Company, which you've already mentioned. But we also have smaller customers um, that have sales teams that are, you know, some just a few dozen people. And um, they're able to use this, the same exact solution. So walk me through that because you're, you're saying it's used in front of them. But as the salesperson, I'm leveraging the tool to acquire the assets and build out that flow yeah. ahead of time, right? So when I do meet them, it helps me with the presentation? Yeah, you actually present out of the solution. So it's, it's um, you know, think about it as something that can exist on your smartphone, your iPad, or on your um, laptop computer, and it can operate completely offline. So you don't need a network connection to provide these experiences to your customer. And um, so I go out and present, just like you would open up your laptop and present from PowerPoint, instead of using that application to present one type of content, now I would open up Mediafly. It's branded for our customers, and they... Um, they leverage that application in front of the cost, in front of their clients and um, uh, present all kinds of content. And, and likewise, if I'm talking to a client and they say, well, you know, I'm also interested in this other product that you have um, instead of, you know, kind of fishing around on your laptop, looking for things, it gives you the ability to pivot in the meeting um, and, and bring up uh, additional relevant insights to that, to that customer. So when do you teach your salespeople to begin presenting versus probing? Well, you know, what's interesting about um, the way things have changed, I think, over the last, you know, 20 or 30 years. um, uh, When I first started in software nearly 20 years ago, um, they always said, you know, you always start with discovery. And... um, the, the challenge with that is that a lot of the B2B buyers are getting frustrated educating the next salesperson that walks in the door. So, you know, what we, what we are telling our salespeople to do and what I've been telling salespeople in, inside and outside of Mediafly to do um, more recently is that they need to, they need to sprinkle in those um, relevant insights uh, that you use to overcome the friction, you know, the, the, the uh, force of static friction in an account, you have to use those in conjunction with your just a little bit while you're doing the discovery so that you keep the, the client engaged. Um, uh, you cut out just a little bit on that last part. Can you say that again? How, you know, about keeping yeah. them engaged. Well, you want to combine your sale, you want to combine some relevant insights. Um, so, you know, things about that B2B buyer's business um, that would help them improve that business. You want to right. include that with the discovery. Sure. So I think, I think one, one area of frustration and friction between buyers and sellers is the thought that, you know, the buyer is sitting there dreading the next initial conversation with a vendor because they're going to spend the whole time answering questions. Right. And, um, well, you know, likewise, you don't want to go in and just turn on the fire hose and say, you know, and, and start spouting off every, um, you know, every marketing message and detail about your product. You want it, you want it to feel like a conversation. And, right. um, so we, you know, what we generally do is, uh, at Mediafly and a lot of our customers do this as well is they have, you know, they have presentation materials that are really used as, as conversation starters, but it is much more of a conversation than it is a presentation. Right. Uh, how hard is it to learn? The, the Mediafly product? Right. Well, so what's interesting is um, our founder, Carson Conant, started the company um, as a, a place to leverage um, – you know, one account across many devices to access digital media like podcasts. And so um, our application actually started out as a, as a consumer facing application. So it doesn't, it requires little or no training. Um, There are some aspects to it, some specific features that are a little more 
uh, detailed today, you know, like how, how the integration works to salesforce.com or how the integration works to um, how to get the most out of your existing relationship with SAP's uh, sales cloud solution. But um, in, in general, a salesperson uh, can open up the application and immediately they can see where they search for content, how they assemble it, and it's very easy to present uh, the solution. Does the prospect know that they're being tracked? Do they know, is it like a read receipt going on or is it done under the hood? So that, so like the tracking of the content that's shared with the customer, right. um, they probably wouldn't know that it was happening. It's, you know, it's, um, but it's, that's very common today. You know, if you receive content that's coming out of a marketing automation solution, chances are it's being tracked. Right. So <clears throat> it's, um, you know, the, the, the thought process behind this is that um, a salesperson, they can see which customers are engaging with the content and which aren't so that they can prioritize, you know, their follow-ups. Right. You know, oftentimes you'll share content with a customer and, and they ask for the content, they ask for the information, um, but they're really just trying to be uh, friendly, you know, trying to be polite and they're not actually interested in your product. Right. And so uh, those types of those types of trackers are, are critical to understanding whether somebody's really interested. Yeah, for sure. So what have you found to be uh, the most effective way to reach out uh, and even generate that initial conversation uh, with these enterprise prospects? Because they're traditionally pretty hard to reach. I mean, they they can afford to have multiple levels of gatekeepers. Uh, and they can be tough to navigate. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think in our business, you know, um, you know, one of the challenges, the first challenge I think a marketing organization has to understand is, is the personas that they're targeting. And, um, and in our particular business, it's, it's pretty challenging to find that exact right person in an account. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, uh, effort that goes into that. But I think once you, once you identify that right person, uh, the person that would, would be interested in our type of solution, um, generally the best way to, um, trigger that person to respond or to engage with you is through, um, you know, some relevant insights, um, that are specific to their industry. So for example, we sent out uh, we have a lot of customers in the food and beverage or CPG space. And um, um, we sent out a, uh, a nurturing campaign. It was an email-based campaign um, talking about um, the impact of our solution on those types of customers. So it was tailored to the people that were receiving it. And, um, you know, and that generated the, the right kinds of responses. We were getting... Um, either accounts that we had talked to in the past that um, hadn't engaged with us um, have, you know, came back as a result of that, uh, of that email uh, campaign. And we've identified some additional opportunities that way. Um, we've done a lot in, it, I don't think there's one right answer. I mean, you have to do some cold calling. Um, you, know, you have to do some direct outreach, but we've tried also as a small company, you've got to leverage, technology in order to, to get the economies of scale and, and the scale of your business to reach all the potential customers. Um, I think the other thing is, especially when you get into the, uh, the SMB space is that just increases the number of, of uh, potential accounts. And so leveraging technology is critical for that. Yeah. Do you think it's technology removing the human aspect of things. I mean, I know in the, in the enterprise space, even the large SMB space, I mean, these guys aren't hanging out on Facebook and Instagram. You know, you're, you're not going to hit them with a Snapchat story or, or ad. Yeah. Um, it's, it's definitely, uh, you know, what's happening, I think to the B2B buyer as a result of changes in technology um, I mean, I've read articles. Uh, I'm sure you've read some of these articles in the past three or four years. One of them by Forrester was called Death of a Salesman. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the reality, I think, this is kind of my personal opinion, is that 
it changes the way that you sell, but it doesn't change the need for the salesperson. Um, so the B2B buyers have at more access to data than ever before. And there's, there's two types of data that they have access to. Um, the first one is, you know, data about the products and services they want to buy. They can go onto the internet today and find a lot more information than they could five years ago, 10 years ago, and certainly, you know, 15, 20 years ago. So they're educating themselves online and they're also leveraging additional resources, um, traditional uh, analysts, um, colleagues through solutions like LinkedIn, um, social media platforms. There, there's forums out there that are specific to certain industries and certain solution areas. Um, you know, our solutions featured on things like G2 Crowd, which is a crowdsourced, it's almost like crowdsourced uh, uh, analysis. So um, there's all these different places they can access information about solutions and services they might want to buy. Um, the problem is that some of the data that they access is, is, is correct, but some of it's inaccurate. So I think the salesperson has to be thinking today, you know, what did they learn about me and my product before I even talked to them? Um, what myths did they learn that I have to dispel? And then what messaging did they pick up on that I actually want to reinforce? So the, so the mindset of the salesperson um, used to be in discovery. I was just thinking about what was the customer's problem. Now I've got to think about what's the customer's problem and what do they think they know about my products and services? Yeah. So that's, that's kind of the, the first set of data. And then the second set is, you know, the data that they actually have about their own business. Um, you know, 20 years ago when I was working, you know, one of my first jobs at GE, my first sales jobs, the first part of the buying process with one of our customers was to tell the customer what they had bought from us. So they didn't, you know, you know, we had all the data and they didn't have the data. Um, that's definitely changed. Um, I mean, I had, I had a customer at Ariba call me one time to ask for the address of one of their suppliers. That was how, that was how bad things used to be. Today, they've got a lot more access to, to uh, information. Um, you know, I think that the, um, the key is understanding what can they leverage, what can that customer leverage um, through, that, through those insights, you know, when they're going out and selling. And that's what, that's what we focus on when we go in to talk to the customer is what data do you, do you have and can your salespeople actually use it in the field? And uh, we've been really successful with a few of our clients um, that had great data but weren't leveraging it. And we put it into our application in a way that the salesperson could apply it at the exact right moment with their clients to drive that client to action. So you mentioned doing an email campaign in B2B. Um, yeah. How have you seen the effectiveness of email change in the last, say, five years? Well, I, you know, certainly um, with the number of emails that you get, I, I know I get a lot of emails <laughs> as a result of my title. And um, I think that the key there is, you know, if the subject line has got to have the hook in it. Um, and it's got to be something unique. And they have to feel like it's not just another, another, um, you know, inbounds email campaign. Um, what we've seen is that the, you know, the open rates, um, uh, if you look at just email campaigns in general, open rates are probably declining. Um, I'd say most, most organizations would say that, um, you know, we found that we really have to have those campaigns very tailored and send them to the exact right person to get the open rates that we need. Um, so, I mean, you're really still talking about single digit uh, open rates on, on most campaigns. And how many, yeah. How many times will you hit a a good prospect with email versus you know other forms of communication? Well, what we what we'll do is if we um, so we have a couple of different ways of, of targeting folks with email. Um, if there's somebody that we've uh, qualified as a lead and maybe they've interacted with our website, um, 
we basically insert them into nurturing campaigns. And because what we found is that those, those clients or those prospects, um, many of them are interested in what we do, but it's just a matter of the timing. So we're, we think it's critical to stay um, foremost in their mind so that when the timing is right, they will, they will eventually respond to one of those. And I would say that, you know, maybe a third of our customers um, came to us as a result of uh, continuous drip, drip, drip of, of nurturing type materials over a period of months or even in some cases a couple of years. And then when the moment was, was right for them, then they responded to one of those. And um, I think that, I think that um, you know, depending on the prospect, and we'll prioritize some of those prospects and we'll go to a more, you know, direct approach of trying to schedule a meeting through, uh, through a cold, through cold calling. Um, or we can, we've also done outreach through direct mail, um, you know, actually a, sending an individual letter to somebody versus sending emails to people. Um, yep. do, do you use a good old fashioned handwritten letter? Yeah, or, or, you know, a hand signed type letter um, kind of depends on, on the prospect. We found that, you know, we've got a few uh, in, the, in the large enterprise space. If you send a letter and it gets to the admin and then you follow up with the admin, a lot of times right. you can get some time on someone's calendar. Right. Yeah. Just by being nice to the executive assistant, huh? Yeah. He or she is usually the key to everything. So Right. They know the calendar, if the boss is in a good mood, or they're making their yeah. numbers. Yeah. Did they forget the anniversary? Now they're in the doghouse. I know. Yeah, treat, absolutely. Treat executive assistant nicely. Um, so what are you seeing, like, with the individual salespeople uh, calling on large enterprise? Um, is it effective to even try to do, like, door-to-door, like, to show up? Or do they have to work the phones, work the emails, you know, get that remote demo confirmed first? Um, or can, can they go to the big cities and knock on doors? Yeah. So what I've found is if you're not, if it's not an existing customer, then the door to door is, uh, is not, is not effective. Cause I think that, um, uh, it's, it's off putting for, you know, certainly for executives, they're just not going to take a meeting with somebody that literally shows up. They want the courtesy of having you schedule something on the calendar. And um, the the only place where I've seen kind of door to door be effective in the large enterprises, you know, if I, when I was at Oracle, I had a set of accounts and a bunch of them were in Chicago and I could literally park the car and, make four or five sales calls without getting back in the car. And maybe you just drop in and see somebody, but you already knew them. They knew you. Um, that was, that's different than, um, right. you know, showing up out of the blue. You can't chasing smokestacks um, used to be, you know, used to be a model in the industrial space, but it's, it's a lot tougher today. I think. Do you follow any form of uh, like the ultimate sales machine, uh, you know, the dream 50 or the dream 100 and, and you know, just have your team just go after those until they get them? Well, we, you know, what we do is we, we look at um, industries where we've had um, some success and we prioritize uh, prospects based on that, trying to, you know, either expand into uh you know, like in our case, the CPG or financial services industry, um, maybe the, the entertainment industry, or we'll take, you know, we'll take a concerted effort to, to try and break into a new industry um, with a very targeted focused message around that uh, industry, you know, either based on our capabilities or a customer case study. So mm-hmm. um, that's, uh, but we do, you know, there's definitely a set of accounts that um, that are prioritized over others. Um, it's not always just the top, you know, the, the top 50. A lot of times it's based on, like I said, an industry focus. Um, and, um, you know, we, 
collaborate internally to determine what things are working and what things aren't as we, as we go out and target those high profile prospects. Do you recommend leveraging like competitors names? Like, let's say you just close a big deal with Chevy, you know, would you send a message to Ford and say, you know, Hey, we just wrapped up a big deal with Chevy. You know, you're interested in, in something similar. Yeah, I, I think it's it's dependent on the industry. So I think um, some industries that's really effective, and some prospects that can be effective. Uh, I think there's others where it can be seen as a negative. Um, mm-hmm. You know, if, you know, we have PepsiCo is one of our biggest uh, customers, and um, you know their competitors, you know, folks like the Coca Cola company you know, they don't respond, they would not be the ones that would respond well to, uh, you know, us saying, Oh, Pepsi uses this Coca-Cola would be like, we're going to use something else then. So, um, I think there, there are definitely examples, um, where that can be effective, but also you got to be careful. Um, just to think about the culture of, of that, you know, how competitive are they? Are they arch enemies or just rivals? Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, you can always even without name dropping, you could mention you've had success in that industry, in the automotive industry. Yeah. Um without ruffling feathers. Well, the nice thing too is in the you know, many of our customers are being in the large enterprise, their competitors already know what they're using in the market. So right. um you know, if if uh let's say hypothetically I was talking to Anheuser Busch they know that Miller Coors uses our solution. Um, right. And then there are other ones where, you know, they're, they might be in a related industry. Um, you know, I've got a company that's a prospect that's in the, in a food industry, but they benchmark with some of the beverage companies. And so right. through that, um, they, they learn that, oh, okay, you know, Miller Coors or PepsiCo is using the apply. Right. Um, all right, man. Final question. You ready for it? Sure. So I like to ask, you know, imagine our listeners, they are, they're jogging, they're on a plane like, as you're about to be, maybe they don't, they didn't fork over the five or 15 bucks for Wi-Fi. Uh, you know, they're driving, can't do something right now, but as soon as they get somewhere where they can apply a lesson from this podcast, I mean, or, you know, What's some final words of wisdom? What should they go do today to move the needle, to grow their sales, to develop themselves, do something? Because I don't want people to just listen. I want them to apply sure. as a result of this interview. Well, I think the first thing is they need to think about those prospects when they get in for that initial engagement. They need to think about where they need to re-educate and in some cases reinforce what that, what that B2B buyer has learned before they showed up because that's a, that's a big change that I've seen in this, in, in selling over the past 20 years is that that buyer thinks they're more educated than they were before. Right. The second second thing is they need to show up on day one with some relevant, uh, hopefully data driven insights about a way that can improve that B2B buyer's business. Um, we did a, we did a study a few years ago, a couple of years ago and, uh, other respondents and there's several hundred B2B buyer respondents, um, 74% of them said that they would buy from the first seller that brought those types of insights to, uh, to their, you know, to their desk. So, um, I think that's, that's critical in thinking about back to that conversation around, um, should I be presenting or should I be doing discovery in that first meeting? The combination of the two, I think, is actually the most powerful. Right. Um, then I think if you're in a transactional selling industry, and there are, there are a lot of great salespeople that are in transactional style businesses, you got to figure out a way to, to try to automate those transactions and so that you can focus your salespeople's engagement on value added services that makes your relationship so critical to that buyer's business that they can't leave you. Right. So, um, in the, in the clients that we have that are transactional selling uh, industries, um, that's been really effective because switching costs, you know, 
switching costs and and loyalty um, are connected uh, directly. And what we see is switching costs in, in most industries are going down. And uh, you've got to figure out a way to, to keep those clients thinking that you're the company that can really continue to drive their business forward. Right. Can, can we go back real quick to that, that 74%? What, was that a study that you did with your company uh, of your own? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a comp- it's a study that we did along with Forrester. It's a joint uh, thought leadership paper that we did with uh, Forrester, which is a major analyst uh, firm. Sure. Yeah. And so you're saying 74% of the B2B buyers would buy from the first salesperson that actually – essentially showed up and brought some value and some meaningful insight and recommendations rather than just asking them questions till they died. Yeah. (laughs) Asking questions till they die or even worse, just brought the PowerPoint in that they showed to the last 10 customers. Right. That's powerful. Yeah. It's, 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 it's also when you think about uh, all the engagements that you might've had over, over your career, um, most salespeople would say, okay, I, I get that. I've seen, I've seen it myself. If they think right. about it, um, they would, you know, they would quickly understand that, that that's the reason. Yeah. yeah. Matt Suggs, media fly. Thanks for coming on the sales podcast, man. Hope you hey. have a great day. Yeah. Thanks for having me. A lot of good info in there. I loved his approach on, you know, email marketing, have a good hook. Uh, the death of a salesman talking about Forrester, you know, of course the professional salesperson is still needed. Professional people are always needed in every industry. They always will be. Even as technology takes over, you still have to know how to fix the technology, how to program the technology, how to troubleshoot it, how to help improve it. But in sales, the person to person, human to human connection is just always going to be needed. We, you know, we're spiritual beings with the physical presence. So how are you helping connect the dots? And so, you know, I I like his approach. Uh, And you notice too, Matt's, I mean, he's a calm dude. He's not this, you know, staying on his head, swing from the chandelier type. Uh, He's methodical in in what he does, but he's professional. Uh, His caring, his concern, his empathy comes through. And that's what you need to be doing in your business as well. Make sure that comes through. Like he says, show up by adding value. I loved how he's talking about, you know, multimedia, multi-touch marketing to stay top of mind. If you've listened to me at all for any length of time, you know, I've been pounding that drum forever. Multimedia, multi-step, multi-touch. That means email. That means direct mail. That means phone calls. That means send a handwritten letter. Follow them on social media. Send them a fax if you can get their information. Figure out how to cut through the clutter. Okay. Multimedia, multi-touch. Uh, If you've listened uh, to this for any amount of time as well, you know that I've been offering my sales training flashcards. You get the digital version for free. If you leave me a five-star review, do a a screenshot of it, you know, Google Play, I mean, wherever you you listen, Spotify, iHeartRadio, you know, please subscribe. That sure does help me. You'll be surprised how much that helps. It helps pop up uh, in the the rankings so people find the show. The more people that find the show come and a small percentage end up buying and I only need a small percentage. So your reviews really help, but I don't know who does it. So if you send me an email, west at the sales uh, I'll send you my sales training flashcards for free. Okay. The, the digital version. And I just trust that you won't share them. You know, like Zig Ziglar says, it's uh, they're copyrighted by law. So they're prohibited from being shared uh, by law and prevented by your good conscience. That Zig was a smart dude. So leave me a review and I will send those to you. I sell those for $20, uh, sell them all the time and they're worth $20. It's uh, 51 pages of objections and how to handle them uh, with some room in there for you to uh, write down a few of your own. Uh, you can also join us for free at the implementors.com. That's my free private Facebook group from listeners. So find me there, ask your questions. I'm happy to answer them. If I'm not on a call uh, or doing some work like this, you know, I'm online and I'm happy to answer it and help you. It's just my way of giving back, making sure you are still growing. Um, I've also been contacted uh, to give some talks. I'm going to Slovenia in, uh, in November to speak at the Simple Conference, S-E-M-P-L. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I've been approached to speak in Florida next May. Uh, so it's a good 11 months out. That's how these, these places book. 
Uh, but if you're looking for a keynote speaker, you know, if you've got an association, 400, 500, up to, I don't know, 1,000, maybe a couple thousand, you know, but on the smaller side, not these 10 or 20,000, 50,000 person arenas, um, I'd probably like that, but I like the smaller venues. Um, I, I do a keynote, and then quite often I'm asked to stick around for the next day and lead some breakout sessions. But if you go to hirethebestspeaker.com, that will redirect to my speaker page. So, you know, if you've got an association, national association, a state association, a regional association, uh, I'm actually having meeting for coffee on uh, when? Tuesday, July 3rd, with um, a realtor that is involved in the Southern California chapter of a real estate association. So uh, we're in talks to for me to speak to that group. So if you're looking for a speaker that will customize the talk and fit it to your um, organization, to your goals, maybe you've got a theme for the event, I'm happy to customize it for you. So please keep me in mind, spread the word. And um, again, hirethebestspeaker.com. That's my website, my speaking page. You see some of my talks. You know, I've done a TEDx talk. I've done opening keynotes in Vegas, uh, Santa Barbara, Phoenix, uh, I don't know, quite a few places. And um, I can do one for you. Um, another thing I'd like to remind you of is my book. It takes more than a big smile, a good idea, and a Twitter account to build a business that lasts. 79 stories on selling with integrity, automating your marketing, and living abundantly. Uh, I've gotten great feedback from that over the years, uh, some nice testimonials uh, in there as well. And it's super cheap, 79stories.info. If you go there and it's 79, the number, 79stories.info, uh, you can buy five and, um, and save some money. You know, So if you've got a few in the office, if you have a bunch, just contact me. Uh, through my website, and I'm happy to um, autograph all of them, and you can save on shipping uh, and even on the price of the books if you order them in bundles. But you can buy one or five on the website right now. Um, so do that as well, 79stories.info. As always, thank you for listening. Now go sell something.